This episode of the Accounting Insiders Podcast is brought to you in part by Zero. Zero is a powerful cloud accounting software that improves efficiencies across your practice. With all client data stored on a single unified ledger, you and your clients can easily access and collaborate on the same set of books. Zero's advisor tools and automation solutions reduce time-consuming manual tasks and put data entry on autopilot. Work faster and more efficiently than ever before with Zero. Visit zero.com slash accounting insiders to learn more. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Accounting Insiders Podcast. My name is Gary Dehart. I am uh, the host of the Accounting Insiders Podcast and the publisher of Insightful Accountant. And today my guest is Jeremy Clopton. Jeremy, welcome. Hey, Gary. Good to see you. Yeah, good to uh, good to be seen. And Jeremy's with Upstream, Upstream Academy. Now you're in, uh, you're actually in Missouri, but the company hails from uh, Montana. Is that correct? That is correct. I am just outside of Branson, Missouri. Got most of the team up in Helena, Montana. So, okay. so, so the logo is fishing as the trout. Are you also, it is. Uh, are you also a fisherman or is that uh, the guys out in Montana? You know, that was all the guys out in Montana. I am not a fisherman. Uh, one of our other team members who lives here in Missouri as well, he's a fisherman. I have just never picked it up. Um, I, I love the idea of moving upstream and solving problems that way, but going out there and finding the fish isn't my thing. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's, I love, I love fishing. Um, don't get to go nearly enough. I did get to go up first year ever in, in Montana. So got to go out there and fish this year, which was, we didn't catch a ton because we were pretty early in the season. Um, yeah. But, I mean, you can't be floating down a river. I was going to say, and especially in Montana, it's such a beautiful place to be. Absolutely. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Let's keep it a secret, right? Keep it a secret. That's right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so Jeremy, give us just, uh, just a quick intro on who you are, what the company is, a little bit about your background, and we'll just dive into our conversation. Yeah, definitely. So I'm the managing director at Upstream Academy, and we are a consulting firm. We work with accounting firms. Uh, we work with probably anywhere from 150 to 200 uh, successful accounting firms across the U.S. and Canada every single year, uh, primarily on leadership development, people development, and focus on you know developing that next generation of leaders, as well as vision and strategy at the leadership level. So really, uh, really helping accounting firms that are successful become even more successful. Uh, I've been with the firm about five and a half years now. Before that, I had my own company for a couple years uh, where I was teaching internationally on, in the anti-fraud space and focused on the applications of technology for anti-fraud and, and fraud investigations, prevention, anti-fraud. whatever it may be. And then uh, before that, I spent 12 years uh, with a national accounting firm in the forensics practice and, and then helped to lead the uh, big data and analytics and digital forensics practices of that firm uh, the last couple of years before I left. Okay. And then, um, and your primary focus at Upstream now, because um, you said your title is managing director, but are you, yep. are you still still training? Yeah, definitely. So leading the firm, but still training, uh, still very active, leading all three of our individual development programs that we have. We have one for new partners, which is our Emerging Leaders Academy. We have one for new managers, which is the new manager academy, and then one for advanced partners, uh, the advanced partner academy for those that are stepping into significant leadership seats in their firm. And I you know, lead those programs as well as work one on one with a number of firms uh, around the country and uh, up in Canada as well on you know where are they at, where do they want to be and how do they get there? And as fast as everything is changing in our profession, uh, those conversations change about every month, it feels like. Yeah, I bet they do. So tell me just a little bit about those courses and this. We didn't talk about this in the in the green room, but um, yeah, definitely. Are they are these year long courses? Are they on online in person? What does that look like? All three courses are what I would consider a hybrid. So they have an online component and then they have one in person component. So one of our very you know, one of our core principles is learning needs to be continuous, right? If you're going to develop yourself into a leader, you can't just show up once for a week and, you know, divine inspiration. And all of a sudden you're just a, a magnificent leader. So uh, for the Emerging Leaders Academy, which is for those that are about to become a partner or new partners, it's a two year program. And we'll have webinars that are uh, throughout the course of the year, excluding March and April, because we're not crazy people. We're not going to do training in March and April. 
And uh, they will have in the first year an in-person component uh, that occurs in the winter. And then the second year, it's actually a capstone in-person conference. Uh, they're both day and a half conferences. Uh, and that one's at the very end of the second year. Uh, both the new manager academy and the advanced partner academy, uh, they are one year program. So a little bit shorter. Uh, they uh, as well, they're going to have webinars throughout the year and then an in-person component at the very end. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're keen on in those beyond just the fact that it needs to be continuous learning throughout the year is there's got to be active goal setting that goes along as well. So in all of those programs, uh, we're working with the participants to help them understand how do you set good goals and how do you work to get incrementally better every single day? And right here's the topic of the month. What are you going to do in the next 30 days to improve in that area? What are you going to do after the next one? And really, as much as anything, developing that practice of continuous growth and development so that they can you know, have that as a practice for the rest of their careers. Yeah, it's about the habit, right? It is. It, it is. Yeah. And so, um, so what are the trends that you're seeing now? So your focus, you know, primarily is around what you just laid out there. But yep. so when somebody calls you and says, hey, we need help or, hey, we heard about you guys. Um, what's kind of the underlying issue firms are dealing with right now or that you're hearing the most of the most demand for right now? People development is still uh, up near the top of what we hear about. Always has been, probably always will be, because I'm convinced that we're always going to have great people in the profession and great people are always want to get better. So we're always going to have people development as one of those. Uh, right now, though, one of the trends that I'm seeing is a lot of firms that are trying to figure out, hey, here's where we are. How do we get to where we want to be? How do we get to that next level, right? How do we go from five to 20 million? How do we go from 20 million to 50 million? And it's really trying to, uh, you know, figure out what are the things that got us to where we are that we unfortunately have to abandon, right? That we've got to change, that we've got to realize that what got us here won't get us to where we're going, that we've got to start to see that change. And one of those big ones that we're seeing is you've got to start running the firm like a business. And that's a hard change to make in our profession, right? It's It's built on partnerships. And I know there's a lot of talk out there about uh, the partnership model is dead and all these different right conversations. You know, the, the big thing that I'm seeing is there are a lot of firms come to that realization. If we're going to get to where we want to be, we've got to figure out how do we start running this thing like a business, which I mean, Gary, let's be honest. They know how, right? That's the great thing is what they do. I, I mean, as a, Right. Yeah, it's what we do, right? We tell all of our clients, I mean, accountants are great at helping their clients figure out how to run their businesses better. We're just so darn busy, it seems like in the accounting profession that folks don't take the time to you know, reflect inward and say, well, how do we run this better as a business? And that's the big thing that a lot of firms are, are really starting to, to come to terms with. And that's really across firms of all sizes is how do we slow down a little bit? How do we start to run the business in a more effective, more efficient manner. It's like in, in your uh, experience, do you know if firms have a good handle? And I have no idea the answer to this question. If firms have a handle on who is a good client versus not a good client? Uh, that, that is, is process too is, is it's very much, okay. very much part of that process. And some firms have a really good handle on it. There's a managing partner that we, that I work with and, uh, you know, we have a group of managing partners that get together every every January. I've got three of them that meet in the same week. And, and one of them, the managing partner in this group, she always starts her update with, here's how many of our clients meet our ideal client characteristics. That's one of her key stats. She's the only one out of three groups that reports that key stat every single time. And there are a growing number of firms that have that have started to do that, that have really started to recognize that it is important to understand who are the clients they want to serve rather than simply saying, well, the client wants us to serve them, so that's a good client. Reality is, it's not true. And I know that's hard to hear because everyone that I know in this profession, they want to help people. They did it to help people. And it's that desire to help that I really think hinders that a little bit where it's like, well, if they're needing help and we're an accountant and they need help with accounting, you know what, by gosh, we're a 
that's a good client for us. And the reality is it's they're really not. Um, right. So there's a growing number of firms that are getting there. There are still a bunch though that they're struggling to figure out what is an ideal client because even at the leadership level, there isn't there isn't agreement on what does an ideal client look like or what kind of client do they want to serve, right? There, there's still, you get to a firm with 15, 20 partners, you got the, you typically see it where part of the partners, you know, we we still want to serve the local community and all the clients we always have. And you got the others are saying, hey, that's not our ideal client. We need bigger, we need more complex, we need in you know specific industries. And there's almost an identity crisis of who is it they want to be and who is it they want to serve. And then as part of your process, you kind of help them weed through that. And I mean, you're not saying, hey, this is your ideal client. You're walking them through the process of identifying. That's exactly that right. And, yeah. And one of the things that firm. exactly. And one of the things that I've learned and I, I learn it more and more every year is there is no one way to run an accounting firm. Uh, there's not a definition of an ideal client that you can just take off the shelf, plug it in, and it's going to work everywhere. Uh, it, it depends on the partners. It depends on the firm's culture. Uh, so yeah, we work them through the process. Uh, you know, who do you want to be is typically one of the first questions, right? What do you want to be known for? Do you want to be that great local firm? Do you want to be that regional firm? Do you want to be the best darn construction firm there is, right? Who is it that you want to be? And then what do you know is true about the clients you want to work with? And for anybody that's listening, I'll say, you know, spoiler alert, they pay the bills is a really good characteristic to include yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, some of you may be laughing right now, but there are plenty that that exclude that. It's like, no, you know, they pay every couple of years. I mean, that's a good client. They care about us. If you're serving as their bank, I don't know that that's necessarily the ideal client. So we help them with that. And, you know, what's interesting, Gary, is even once they define it, putting it into practice is hard, right? What's the process to then hold partners accountable to only let in the right clients? There's a firm uh, in the Northwest. I love their uh, the phrasing. They were at our Headwaters conference a few years back and they said, we only work with clients that deserve to be our clients. I'm like, what a healthy mindset that is. You don't hear it very often, but they're deliberate. They're like, look, we're not for everybody and everybody's not for us. That's okay. And we're going to be intentional about who we say yes to. Well, I guess the second challenge, too, along those same lines is getting rid of those existing clients who you've had for a long time. Might not be as hard to get rid of like a client you've had for a year. You've done a little bit of work for them. But you know, here's a legacy client that doesn't fit the new model or doesn't fit what we've decided as a firm. Hey, this is this is our persona. This is our ideal client. This is who we want. And unfortunately, 30% of our client base doesn't fit that, that model. That's right. Yeah. And how you got to offload them. Yeah. Yeah. How, and how, what, what, what are the recommendations around that? Yeah. There are a number of ways to do that. And I'll just acknowledge, I'll start off by acknowledging the fact that every firm that I've ever talked to that's doing this worries about their reputation in the community because they're in a small community. And I don't care if they're in the middle of South Dakota or the middle of the Dallas Metroplex in their mind, they're in a small community. And it's just, it's, it's because the people that you serve, you know, and you have relationships. And as you said, some clients, they're easier to get rid of than others. I, I don't know very many firms that are struggling to get rid of clients that treat their people like crap, right? Those are the, those are easy to get rid of, right? Those are, they just don't fit. They're, they're gone. But what about those clients? They pay the bills. They've been around forever. You, you go to church with them and the reality is a lot of those clients, they're business owners as well, right? They understand what business means and that's why they're one of your clients. And often it's it's an honest conversation that, hey, we're not serving you the way that you probably need to be served. And it's because it's not, it, it's not an ideal relationship. Um, for us to serve you the way that would be best, the fee probably doesn't make sense, but we know there are firms that do. So, you know, sometimes it's having a uh, a warm referral. I know that some legal departments and um, discourage that. I've worked with some firms that their legal said, you are not going to provide any recommendations to anybody else. And if that's the case, hey, I am not here to give legal advice. I'm not qualified to do so. But, you know, I, I always like the idea of saying, you know what, we, we're probably not the right fit for you anymore. 
And um, there are some firms that are, here's five or six that that would be great and have that warm referral that you can send them over to. Look, that makes it easy, right? That everybody feels good at the end of the day. But let's keep in mind, there isn't an obligation to serve any client. At, at the end of the day, you've got to you've got to decide, are you willing to make the business decision? And I'm not saying that's easy. It's not. I mean, it's simple, but it's ridiculously hard. And figuring out what are you willing to do? Um, one of the best ways that I've seen firms do this is they don't just go in and get rid of all the wrong clients day one. Because I mean that's a that's a cash flow issue, right? I mean, yeah. I'm not I'm not sending all no. I gotta pay the bills. I can't send everybody Dollar away. It's pay, like right? yeah. yeah, it's like I had somebody get come back from a conference one time and they're like, hey, they told me if I'm doing compliance, I need to fire all the compliance clients and just do advisory. What do you think? And I said, Well, what pays your bills? And they said, Well, the compliance work. I'm like, I probably wouldn't go fire all the well, compliance well, clients. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. gotta keep in business. So it's knowing when a better opportunity comes along, who are you gonna say no to? Hey, we need to say yes over here because that's moving our firm in the direction we want the firm to go. That means we need to go say no to these three or four or five clients because they're no longer the best fit for us. That makes it a little bit easier. At the end of the day, I've seen firms send letters, right? And it's, hey, you got this letter. We're no longer your account and find a new one. So again, a bunch of different ways harsh. to do it. It does. I, I tend yeah. to prefer the warm referral or the the conversation. But look, I mean, at Upstream, we talk about the fact there are th four types of clients in a firm. And, and I'll simplify it quickly. A-level clients are awesome, right? And they're the ones that are your raving fans. They send you referrals. They want to work with you. You want to work with them. You're their advisor. You're their everything. And they're going and telling everybody about you, right? That's a small proportion of clients in a lot of firms. Uh, but those are the clients that if you could work with them every single day, you'd have nothing but A clients. You'd love it. B clients are better than most, right? They see the value in working with you. Uh, you're probably their advisor. They may not be sending you referrals. They're not out there as a raving fan, but you like working with them. Uh, A-level clients are the ones the partner should be working on. B-level clients, some partners, senior managers, right? They're, they're working on them. C-level clients are, are good clients. They're not great, but they're good. They're compliance. They don't complain. Uh, you know, Just get in, do the work, get out. I'll pay your bill. I don't need to see you all year long. I don't need an advisor. I don't want an advisor. The bank said I got to get this done. You're the one that's going to do it for me, and I value working with you. I'll pay the bill, right? That's a, B, and C. C-level clients, a great training spot for new leaders, right? Managers, supervisors, they're easy clients to work with. They're not super demanding or complex or a great place to kind of cut your teeth from a leadership standpoint. And then you got this big chasm. And then you've got the D-level clients. And D-level clients, they don't become C-level clients. You don't want to work with them. They don't want to work with you. Some of them treat your people like crap. Again, those are the easy ones to get rid of. Um, maybe they're financially, they're just, they're just perpetually losing money. They argue about the bill, right? They see every invoice as an invitation to a debate, right? That's a D level client. And those are the ones that frankly, send them a letter might be as courteous as it needs to be. I realize that sounds harsh, but every firm has those clients and we overcomplicate it, Gary. Like if I, you know, if you were running a firm and you had a book of business, I could probably come to you and say, Gary, if you could not work with five clients ever again, can you name those five clients? And there's a pretty good chance you could name those five clients within about five seconds. You're like, yeah, boom, 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 done. Right? Those are your D-level clients. Those are the easy ones to get rid of. But sometimes we just hang on to it. Um, our founder always talked about it. It's like there's a Hippocratic Oath that we all signed that said, we will do the taxes if they ask us to do the taxes. It's like, no, we don't have to do that. Yeah, don't have to. And are you familiar with uh, tax titans? I am not. So uh, look it up after, you know, afterwards. They started, um, I want to say it's about two and a half, maybe three years ago. And um, I've interviewed the guy and I've, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but basically one of their, one of their pitches or the purposes of, of the company is to be a place where firms can direct their clients that they don't really want to work with anymore. And hmm. it's a, and again, it would be those D level clients, the ones you, yep. you don't have a relationship with and you really just want to get rid of them and you don't, 
and you'd feel bad if you actually passed them on to a friend, right? Um, right. And so, so what they're attempting to do is build basically a platform where accounting firms can go, hey, you know what, John Doe, go to taxtitans.com or whatever the, the URL is, and you can find, you know, a list of, you know, 2,000 client, you know, accounting firms yeah. within 50 miles, whatever it is. And so it might be worth taking a look at just so you can point your, your definitely there. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And so, so let's transition the, the topic a little bit over to technology. And mm -hmm. cause I, I think certainly as your, as firms grow, I mean, technology now it's, it's every day in our life, right? We can't get away from it. Um, yep. But if we, but if we leverage it correctly, it can be, you know, a game changer for us personally, professionally, um, pretty much in all walks of our lives. So how do, how do firms go through that process of onboarding new tech or um, really even identifying the tech that they should have in their firms? Because, I mean, you know better than I, we've got firms in the space that are running on you know, the oldest version of QuickBooks that they could possibly still be running and yeah. um, up to 100% cloud-based and uh, but what are you seeing in, in the way that firms manage technology and a transition to technology? There I'm not is sure how much that's in, in your wheelhouse, but yeah, and we don't work we don't work with a lot of firms as far as on the process side of it. Um, but again, kind of having that background in technology, we've worked with a lot of firms on launching analytics practices, launching new services. And anytime we're talking strategic planning and vision, I mean, let's be honest, tech comes up. I mean, if you think about the firm that you want to be in five years, if you don't mention technology, you're probably missing a significant component. I would say that the most important thing for a firm and the place that I see some firms go wrong is they don't understand why they need it or why they're even doing it. And that's such an important first question is, why do we need this technology? And I joke with firms that I work with, if your response is ever because Jeremy said that we need it, that is the worst possible answer Perfect. you could use to justify doing something. Like if you can't figure out why you actually need it, please don't do it. Because the fact that I told you, the fact that you heard it at a conference, the fact that you read it on a blog somewhere, that doesn't actually mean it's right for you. It means that it's out there. It means that it's a possibility. But the very first thing the firms have to do is they've got to figure out why why are they even thinking about the technology? And, you know, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? Are you trying to become more efficient? Are you trying to become more effective? I can't remember. I wish I could remember the statistic. I can't, but I remember, you know, one of the books that I was reading and they were, it was, I think it was actually on the topic of work-life balance, right? When technology the advent of technology and we started utilizing technology in business, it was like, this is going to shorten the week down to where nobody has to work five days a week. I mean, let alone, right, these 80 hours or anything like that. Right. Technology will make us better. Unfortunately, it's made us faster. And we don't need to hustle harder. I I'm not convinced that we need to figure out how to work faster for 80 hours. Uh, I am very much convinced that we need to figure out why do we think technology is the right answer? Because in a lot of situations, what I find is the process is broken to the point at which technology is not going to fix it, right? Technology is not the solution. It's often the tool that makes the solution possible. And if a firm can't first figure out what the problem is, Technology is just going to be an expensive band-aid that's probably eventually going to fail one day and make the problem worse. Um, so when it comes to onboarding new tech, you've got to figure out your why. And you've got to get enough buy-in at, at the top levels that that is a problem that needs to be solved right now. Um, there are a lot of things that I, I mean, I love new tech. I love apps. I love shiny objects. Like I could buy something new every single, right? I, it's easy to fall into that trap, but that's, Again, the fact that it's new and everybody's talking about it doesn't mean that it actually solves a problem you need to solve. Um, right. So that's the first and probably the biggest step in my view. 
Yeah, I like that. Just the why. Why are you doing it? And and I think, in my opinion, number two is if you do onboard it or if you decide, hey, we're going to onboard it, who's the champion? Because mm-hmm. if you don't yeah. have, you know, internally, if you don't have a champion for the product or for the process or for the tool, you're either not going to use it or you're not going to use it, certainly won't use it to its fullest potential. And, exactly. Um, and so you're spending a lot of money that either, like you said, shouldn't be spending at all or could be getting a lot more purpose out of or use out of if you were, yeah. if you had the right people on, on board with it. So And, when, and you um, see that a lot with CRMs, right? Yeah. That, that's one place that I see it a lot is, you know, for, oh, we got to have a CRM, we got to have a CRM. And, and one of my very first questions is, what are you doing to track information about your clients now? Well, we're not doing anything, but a CRM will do it. You probably won't. You're going to spend a lot of money to get a piece of software that you still have to enter information into. It's not like it's just going to pull it from your mind and put it in there for you. And if even if you just have one champion, like they've got to be able to be the person that only understands it, but then gets everybody else to be excited to use it because that's then the next step, right? Is one person, well, that's great, but it's probably not going to justify the expense of new software. But if you can, if they can get everybody else excited about it on board, then it's really transformational. And then somebody's got to police it, as, as I've shared with you. Oh, yeah. I've been I've been in in data problems for the past couple of weeks, and you know, yeah, if bad data goes in, you're going to get bad data out, and so you need somebody there that's kind of monitoring it on a somewhat regular basis, right? So that mm-hmm. opens up a whole other issue of people and, and process and technologies that, that I'm sure you guys get to address in a lot of what you do. So um, did I ask this already? I don't, I don't think I did, but that is like right now. Um, so you're primarily around growing leaders. I don't think we've touched on um, the just the issue of headcount. And mm. that people aren't coming into the profession at the rate that they used to come into. What? How are you? Or how are you advising firms? Or how are you seeing firms deal with that? When it comes to the the talent side of things, one of the very first questions that I always like to ask within a firm is, "What do you actually need an accountant for? Like, what are the things that you truly need your accountants to be able to do? What is? What do you? What?" do you actually need a CPA? Where do you need them within the firm? And then how do you level up everybody that's in that, that, you know, has the, the credentials can pa- has passed the exam, whatever it may be that are on the, that's on the CPA path. How do you level them up to get them doing the things that only a CPA can do? And then the question from there becomes, okay, of all the other things that don't require a CPA, is it finding somebody else to do it or is it finding technology to do it? And, or is it outsourcing, right? I know there's a lot of talk right now. It used to be a pyramid uh, from a staffing model standpoint. Now it's more of a diamond with two flanking triangles of outsourcing and and automation. And I fully buy into that. Um, when when I think about the, the talent shortage, it, there's a talent shortage everywhere, as I understand it. I was talking with uh, somebody a few weeks back and they were talking about it in other industries as well that they work in. They're like, hey, there's talent shortage there. It's not like it's just accountants. It's There's talent shortages, period. Uh, so the question becomes, if we only have a certain number of people that want to become CPAs, what are the things that we need CPAs to do? And how do we ensure that we get the CPAs doing those things immediately? And how do we find other people that want to do the other things as well? Because there are a lot of things that task-wise that for a long time we've said, oh, well, you've got to be only first year, right? They've got to be a first year person to do that. And the reality is you don't need to be an accountant to do that, right? You don't need to be an accountant for a lot of the, the data entry, frankly, for a lot of the testing in some things. And on the consulting side, there are a lot of consultative type roles now that you don't need any accounting. You're not even dealing with the true accounting side of things. You need some business acumen you need to understand, or you need to be paired with somebody that does. So what I'm encouraging firms to do is figure out where do you need accountants and where do you need people? And then make sure that you're matching it right. And by all means, 
stop underestimating what young people can do. Like give people credit that they can, they can accomplish more than you think that they can. And the reason that I say that is one of the, one of the things that I hear a lot is young people aren't as good as they used to be. It sounds like a Toby Keith song, right? Um, And I finally just, I mean, that always drives me nuts because it's this generational tension, right? And I'm a millennial. I'm an old millennial. Somebody called me a geriatric millennial once. And I thought, let's, I'm okay with millennial. Geriatric seems a bit harsh, but anyway, um, right now we're talking about the next generation and they're talking about them the exact same way. So I finally started asking partners. I'm like, Hey, if the, the new generation isn't as good as you were, help me understand how did you get as good as you are? Like, what was it? when you were young, that made you so good. And by the way, I think we all have an inflated sense of how good we were when we were 23, right? The farther we get from 23, the better we were at 23 uh, is my genuine belief. And, uh, you know, partners, I mean, almost every single one of them is that, well, somebody gave me a project and said, go figure it out and go do it. They believed that I could do it. Or if I didn't do it, right? They stepped up and they helped me figure out how to do it. They gave me feedback. They let me screw up. They let me make mistakes. They let me fail. And they made me learn. I said, great. When was the last time you did that for somebody? Oh, I don't have time to do that. I'm too busy. It's like, okay. So that's the other thing that we've got to do on the talent shortage is we've got to figure out how do we get more out of the people that we have? And I don't mean more hours. I mean, more of their potential. I mean, why, let's just stop assuming they can't start assuming that they can and maybe give them the freedom to, to learn, to actually do it. I think that that will go so far in our profession right now. Yeah, that's a great point. And freedom to fail. Right. And, and yeah. the, the understanding that I expect you to, that you're going to make mistakes and it's okay. Right. Yes. And so are you seeing, um, when the, when they when firms are taking that broader look at what um, type of person fills the role for a firm, are you seeing any particular, I guess from outside the firms, what I'm speaking of, are you seeing any particular um, consistency in what type of, of people they're bringing in? Like, are they bringing you know retired teachers or stay at home moms that are coming out, or people who are in you know currently working at Burger King, but they can sure. you know, run a, a 10 key. Yeah. I, I don't know that I have enough consistency across clients to say anywhere in particular, as far as a demographic, I will say that more and more are looking toward uh, community colleges where folks are getting associates degrees. I've heard that all from a lot of firms uh, where, you know, maybe they're getting an associates in accounting and they don't want to be a CPA. They don't want to be a partner, uh, which by the way, that's okay. Let's all go ahead and acknowledge the fact that not everybody wants to be a partner and we don't, we never actually believed everybody could be a partner anyway. So it's okay that not everybody wants to. So finding somebody that comes in with that associate's degree and, you know, making them, helping them be really successful. And some of them I've heard, you know, they said, Hey, they decided later on, oh, I actually oh, do want to go back and get my, you know, get the hours, become a CPA, all the things. So uh, that's probably the most common that I'm seeing. Uh, I am seeing some that, uh, as you mentioned, right, folks that have left the workforce, perhaps to take care of family, uh, whether it's kids, aging parents, whatever it may be, and now they're coming back, uh, has been uh, valuable. Uh, I've got a couple firms in the Southeast, in the sunny states, uh, that uh, actually take on retired accountants uh, that are looking for a little bit of stuff to do in the spring when Florida's not quite as warm as it is in the summer. Uh, and right. I said, you know, that's a, you got a unique demographic in your backyard that you can hire. I'd take right. advantage of that all day, every day. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some of it. it. The great thing is there are so many things in an accounting firm that if you just find someone that has a work ethic, understands business at a base level and has a desire to continue learning, they could go so far in our profession. Maybe they won't ever be a partner. Maybe they, you know, they're never going to run the firm. You know what? That's okay. We need great managers that want to be managers their entire career, but we need people that can inspire the next generation that can lead, that can train, that can develop. 
You mentioned retired teachers. I was talking with a firm recently and they were talking about learning and development. How do they get, you know, how do they get a learning and development director, director right? Somebody that could go in and help, uh, un, you know, figure out what's the training curriculum need to be. I said, you know, one, let's find it. Go find a school teacher that wants to make a better salary. I mean, they understand curriculum. They understand teaching. And yes, there's a difference between teaching maybe elementary school students and adults. My wife's a high school counselor, and I'm amazed how many conversations that we have. And we're dealing with similar issues just with people that are different ages. She's dealing with 16-year-olds. I'm dealing with 46-year-olds. Uh, it's you know, So there's a lot of similarities in, in teaching. So that's another great place, especially for firms that are you know struggling with the people development. Find a resource. There's so many talented people that could benefit our profession. They just aren't accountants and that's okay. Right. Yeah. And yeah, my wife's a third grade teacher and <laughs> at yeah. a private, you know, at a small private school. So, you know, so she's making the big bucks. I'm like, you know, you maybe go find a job somewhere, you pay a little bit better. So I'm going to tell her to go look for some accounting firms. That's uh, right. That's right. Some. So, all right. So um, anything else that we haven't talked about? I think we cover it. Well, work-life balance, actually. I think we do want to t touch on that yeah. briefly. And and I think how can, how do firms really embrace a work-life balance, you know, for the firm, right? Because, you know, yeah, like the people coming into the profession don't want to work 80 or 90 hours a week. They're not going well. My understanding is they're they're like, I'm not doing that. It's not my jam. That's your jam, old man. It's not mine. So yep. how how are firms handling that? Yeah. Well, first let's acknowledge most most people in the profession don't want to work 80 hours a week either. They just do because they have forever. Uh there's very few that actually want to. <laughs> there's it's just yeah, a yeah. habit, right? Um, so when it comes to work life balance, a, a few things. First and foremost, it is not a destination right? It, it is not a place you're getting. It is an action. It, it is balancing life and work. And that mindset shift is really important that you're never going to find perfect equilibrium, right? We talk about work-life balance like it's a noun, like it's a, this thing that you achieve and then you're in this just like magical bliss forever. It does not happen that way, right? You are actively balancing life and work every day. And some days I work more than I, do, you know, th than I don't. And other days I'm hanging out with the family, doing things more than I'm not, right? Then I'm working. So you've got to recognize this is ongoing and you're never going to hit some destination. There's no scoreboard where somebody's going to go all time and you're going to say, are they perfectly balanced? All right, great, I hit it. Uh, so that's that's a really important thing. And the second thing for firms to keep in mind, especially and specifically talking to firm leaders, is you are the model that everyone else is looking up to in your firm, whether you believe they are or not. When I see firm leaders that are working 3,000, 3,200 hours a year, and they're saying, well, we're telling people they don't have to. Look, the reality is they're seeing you do it. Their expectation is that they have to to get to be successful, and they're going to self-select out if they believe that to be true. Um, I, I'm not asking or requesting that firm leaders only work 40 hours a week because I know there are a lot of firm leaders that you know work in a 50 hour a week that I mean look that's the firm they own that it, it is what they do they love it they are passionate about it and that's great so I'm not here to tell somebody you have to only work 40 hours a week so please don't take it that way the other thing though that is so important and it ties back to our conversation around technology is the technology can only go so far in balancing life and work, right? You can maximize your calendar. You can have it, you know, optimized. Everything's perfect. Every, you know, it looks great. But if you, at the end of the day, still feel like you aren't accomplishing enough or uh, you didn't get enough things done, right? Your, your mindset will sabotage what all the technology helped you do. Right. So you've got to get in that place of really figuring out, okay, what's important? Uh, what are my definitions of success for today? I, I use a, a method of three, right? What are the three things that I've got to get done today above all others? Uh, is there more I can get done? Yeah, there should be something on my to-do list that I don't get to every single day until I retire and check that last box of enjoy retirement. All right, and then I'll have another to-do list, I'm sure. Uh, so you, you know, right, you're always going to have something. So do you recognize what it is? But the other thing that I'll say uh, as well around technology is 
don't use it just to go faster. Use it to be more effective. And that can be effective at getting the work done, uh, protecting time to be focused and actually get, you know, get two hours of work, you know, of time where you can just focus on the most important thing. You know, use technology to help you with that. Don't use technology to distract you from that. And that's what a lot of, a lot of time what we do is we have so many notifications. We have so many ways, right? It used to be an open door policy. My door was open, you could come in. Well, now it's an open Teams, an open phone, an open text, an open messenger, an open email, and you're just inundated. And here's the thing, all of that, it's other people's priorities, not yours. And when you let their priorities take you take you over, you're, uh, you're using technology to distract yourself. And most people will never admit that. I didn't want to admit it for a long time. You've got to step back and say, how will I use technology to improve my focus, not maximize my distractions? And you, you start being really intentional about it. And you tell people, hey, uh, I've used, I've actually used an autoresponder when I'm in the office. Hey, I'm in the office today. I've got uh, three different trainings that I'll be leading over the course of the day. I'm not going to be checking email until the end of the day or the following morning. If something is urgent, here's how you can get a hold of somebody on the team that knows how to get in contact with me. All right. So that sets the expectation. That's using technology to protect the focus rather than not. And we have an aversion to that. And we always we do it through the lens of client service. Well, if I do that, is that good client service? And I would push back and I would, I'd almost flip the question around. If you're letting everybody else's priorities distract you from what you need to be focused on, are you actually serving your A and your B level clients? As we talked about earlier, are you serving them to the level that they deserve to be served? Right. Uh, yeah, because that's a great way to put it. And they're not the ones reaching out and yeah. pinging right. you. Right, yeah, they're not the ones pinging you all the time. Those, they aren't yeah. the loud ones. Those are the D level clients. They're the loudest and they're the ones that, demand your attention. They pull you into quadrant one, as Covey always talked about. And now you've got to figure out how do I, how do I realign to where I can, where I can serve them. Um, and it goes beyond that. I mean, balancing life and work, look, you can use technology, you can do all those things, but you also have to understand how do you, why do you operate the way you do? All right. So I talk about it. I've talked about it on our podcast before, um, you know, one of the, when I go into workaholic mode, it's typically because I'm stressed out from something, which is a very vicious circle. Can I just, you know, right. Tell you if I'm, if I'm stressed out from work, my default is to work more, which is not a great place to be. Uh, so I've right. got to be able to catch myself and understand, Hey, that's actually not serving my purpose. If I'm stressed out by something going on and look, we all have deadlines. We don't work in a stress-free environment. Some stress is good. But it's recognizing, hey, it's getting out of control. You got to actually step back. I know you feel like doing more is going to help. It's actually perpetuating it. Stop, go for a walk. Take 10 minutes. Right? Just walk around the block real quick. I live in the middle of nowhere. Right. Walk down the road a ways. Uh, so, you know, it, it goes beyond just the all the things that we talk about, the productivity hacks. And it really goes back to understanding what is it that's holding you back from feeling that balance as well. Um, and, and that's a really, really powerful thing. And when firms start to talk about that, right, what is it that, why do you not feel like you're balanced? Um, and understanding that it's, you know, one example, I was talking with a partner recently. He, he's like, I didn't have dinner with my wife and kids three nights last week. I said, okay, well, what would balance look like to you? He goes, I would have dinner with my wife and kids four out of the five nights during tax season. Like that for me means that I am balancing effectively. I said, can you work afterward? He goes, of course, I don't care about that. I want to make sure that I'm home for dinner. I said, great. Then that's your definition. And the firm leadership needs to know it's, that's such a little thing in the grand scheme. Yeah. Right. And it's something I call a near non-negotiable. What is the right. thing that you need to do more often than not to know that you feel balanced? For me right now, uh, my, I have three girls and they all play softball and my wife and I help coach, uh, all their teams right now. The oldest two are on the same team and the youngest is on a different one. And for me, it's how many practices and games can I get to? I want to make sure that I am at more practices and games than I am not at. And that second half of their season coincides with my busiest time, right? Because once accountants obviously get out of tax season, 
we end up doing a little bit more. So I travel and I'll end up missing, I think, uh, probably two games out of the season for each, for each of my daughters. I'm like, Hey, that's still really good, right? That's seven weeks of practice. I'm hitting it. And then I'm going to hit, um, probably 80% of the games. Is it perfect? No, but I feel really good about it because it's a lot better than what it used to be because I'm intentional with it. Right. Yeah. And I like that. I I think the intentionality and and, uh, the biggest thing I've gotten out of the entire conversation is, is why, right. And that's, yes, I imagine that's, that's, I imagine that's a big part of your job really is just to go, why? Why? Exactly. Yeah. Why? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yep. Maybe I I feel like a four year old sometimes. I just keep saying why. Why? I'm the why guy. That's right. (laughs) Put it on replay. Just every three, three Uh minutes. (laughs) why so exactly but it does come back to that right and in almost everything why are we like for us why do we cover what we cover why do we have podcast guests that we have and and these aren't we actually my call that i had prior to this was over another little piece of technology that that we're working on and kind of halfway through it that that was my question like why are we why are we doing this and it yeah um and, or why are we doing this now? Yeah, you know, might be mm-hmm. a great idea, and it yeah. might be something that we need to do. But why are we doing it now? You know, and so, exactly right. Because again, we're very small, so we don't have people to to task to go do a lot of task. Right? I mean, it's it's me or my business partner. We have a couple other people, but um, so we can't do everything. And it goes back to the why. I'm going to start. I'm going to use that a lot. Why are we doing that? And so here yeah, we go. another right. really good one I'll add to your list there is why me? Am I the right Even person better. for this? Am I <laughs> yeah. the right person to do this? And especially in a firm that's growing, uh, sole proprietor or, or you know just a handful of partner type firms, why is this coming to me? Am I the right person to be doing this? And if not, who is? And really protecting that. And I know as I've stepped into the leadership role here at Upstream, uh, the closer we got as we had our, you know, the succession plan and the transition, uh, I had to get, and I still struggle with it sometimes because I like to do things, but I have to, I can't do everything. And I have to ask that question. Why am I the right person to do this? Or am I the right person to do this? And if not, who is, and then how do we get it to them? Because there are, you know, there are a lot of things that you'll take on, especially if you're a founder, if you're an owner, that you'll take on because, well, it just needs to get done. Okay, well, why am I the right person to do this? And more often than not, I think you'll find that the answer is, well, I'm really not other than I didn't think to give it to somebody else. Or maybe I don't trust somebody else to do it, which then becomes, okay, why do I not trust them? And then you've got to work through that because why are they an employee if I don't trust them? <laughs> like, exactly. Why yeah. are they here? I mean, there's a lot of whys that you can go down to. And, you know, yes, we're upstream academy. Yes, there's a trout on there, but right, that's upstream thinking, right? As we're going upstream to figure out, okay, what are the actual problems, right? The problem is, isn't the fact that I'm doing the wrong thing. The problem is I hired somebody that I don't trust. So therefore I don't give them anything. Okay, well, that's a whole different issue to solve than why do you have too much on your plate? Why, why are you doing that? So- yeah, that's a great point. So before we wrap up, I so see you've got a yep. stack of books back there. What are your uh, top couple of couple three books that you recommend that, that um, people read? Yeah, so Free to Focus by Michael Hyatt is always my number one. It's just a spectacular book. Um, it helps with that whole idea of creating the focus time. And that is so incredibly valuable. Uh, so I definitely recommend that one. I, I think it's a great book. Um, there are so many good ones. Uh, I, I'm going to go with a slightly different one uh, that I really like. And I think it's helpful for folks that are business owners running a firm. And it's Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke, a professional poker player. And it's how to make decisions when you don't have all the information. And, and it's a really insightful, uh, a really insightful book into the idea that you, you never have all the information you need to make a full decision. So you've got to make a decision to get more information and then you improve the decision from there. And you just, how it's more of an iterative process. And the, in business, you never have everything you need to have, right? Information wise. So 
Uh, those are probably two of my favorites. I've got, I mean, so many different books that I absolutely love. I've got stacks all over the place, but those would be the two I'll go with today. All right, great. I'll, uh, I don't know either one of those, so I'll have to look them up. And then lastly, how do people find you? How do people find uh, Upstream Academy? Definitely. So they can find Upstream Academy online. We're at upstreamacademy.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and it's uh, my handle is Jeremy Clopton, all one word. Uh, last name is C-L-O-P-T-O-N. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, we also have a podcast called The Upstream Leader. Uh, and you can find that anywhere uh, that you find podcasts or at theupstreamleader.com. Fantastic. Oh, last one. I said that was the last one, but there's one more. There you go. Uh, any shows that, that you're uh, speaking at or that you guys exhibit at? Uh, we like have a conference coming up this July. It's our Headwaters Conference. So I'll be uh, the opening keynote. It will be in, uh, it's July 11th and 12th in Chicago. Uh, we've got some great speakers. Uh, we've got John Sensaba. We've got Courtney Durandi. Heath Alloway from Upstream will be there. Uh, Jackie Cardello from GRF CPAs uh, will be speaking about partner compensation. Um, we, we've got a, a great lineup, many more speakers as well. Uh, so that is probably the uh, next best place to find me. Uh, July 11th and 12th, Headwaters Conference in Chicago. Sounds great. All right. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, enjoyed the conversation. And certainly, and also, you know, we didn't talk about this before, but, you know, if you do any writing and have an interest, yeah. please, you know, we're, we're always accepting contributed content. So we'd love Sounds to get some of if that's something you guys do. I appreciate that, Gary. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. This episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast is brought to you by Out of the Box Technology. Out of the Box Technology is your partner in accounting data services. With over 7,500 industry migrations performed and an expansive network of third-party integrations, a partnership with Out of the Box will augment your advisory practice and turbocharge client accounting operations. Visit outofthebox.technology.com slash insightful-accountant to get started.